And Wimp, these people are all farmers and ranchers, and we have many, many things in common, and I welcome you here to our national convention. President Bill Wimpsinger. Well, thank you very much, President Woodland, officers and uh, distinguished guests of NFO, delegates, brothers and sisters. Uh, you can't possibly imagine what a thrill it is for someone like myself to have this opportunity to uh, share briefly in your convention and be among individual proprietors for the most part, certainly entrepreneurs uh, one and all, who believe in and actively practice Collective bargaining, it's marvelous. And I suspect I could spend quite a while uh, extolling that virtue, but uh, there's a lot to be said these days, I think, and I trust you'll forgive me, Mr. President, if I dispense with uh, the amenities and uh, the niceties and even some of the levity that's uh, always supposed to be injected into any kind of a presentation and get right down to the heart of things uh, as we see them where I come from. What we are living in today, I think you know as well as I do, is a deliberately contrived economic depression in the United States of America, and really that's what brings us together today. That's why I am here. That's why I think uh, you welcome me here. And I think it's fair to say that throughout the course of the history of our country, hard times have always been the incubator of farmer union alliances up and down the country. I think you'll remember, and let me recant for you, the hard times uh, that forced farmers and trade unionists to form the Greenback Party all the way back in the 1860s. William Jennings Bryan's Populist Party in the 1890s, Eugene Debs Socialist Party, the latter half of uh, the latter part of last century and through the early and mid 1900s, North Dakota's nonpartisan political league in the post World War I period, Wisconsin's and the Progressive Party in the 1920s, Minnesota's Farm Labor Party in the 1930s which later on, I think you remember, became the Democratic Farm Labor Party. Hard times, it seems, always bring us together. But I think there is, as well, another factor that uh, put us together in what are right now going to be viewed later as uh, historic uh, economic and political alliances. And that's the fact that both the major political parties, Republican and Democrat, had become captives of the rich and the captains of industry, the big corporations. That's been the case in each of the periods when we found ourselves driven together. And it was always a case where the political party system became dominated by a two-headed calf. One head labeled Democrat, the other Republican, but the message that each bawled was always the same. And the message was, that's what, what's good for those who reside at the very apex of the nation's economic pyramid was certainly good for those who dwell or subsist somewhere at the base of that pyramid. What's good for the rich? and a few nation-sized corporations is also good for family farmers, workers, the poor, all of whom support those who reside at the apex of the pyramid. And the litany always was, feed the bulls of Wall Street so that the sparrows of Main Street can eat. Well. That could be true. But the trouble's always been that none of the good ever seems to trickle down, except perhaps in times of war, when we exchange methodically the lives of our young people for the temporary profits of conflict. 
It never seems to trickle down, and that's why you see the battle cry of so many workers today being, don't trickle down on me. <laughs> this two-headed calf feeds at the corporate trough on the promises of free market economics and preaches, preaches always the virtues of the holy trinity of free enterprise in the name of supply, demand, and the mystical marketplace. Amen. <laughs> but all it really passes on to its laboring constituents is the crap and the hot air of prosperity around the corner, Herbert Hoover's two chickens in every pot and two cars in every garage, and all of that sort of thing. Well, out in the Southwest, there's another name for the two-headed calf. It's often called the Spotted Republican or the Pinto Democrat. <clears throat> and that's a political show horse, you see. A horse, a horse with uh, spots so damn big anymore that you can't tell whether the animal is brown with white spots or white with brown spots. And up in Canada, our very friendly and uh, highly regarded neighbors to the north, very much like us, workers and farmers have another way of putting it. They say that they have white cats and black cats. White cats are the liberals, black cats are the conservatives, and for years and years and years, all farmer mice and worker mice voted for either the white cat or the black cat. And they switched back and forth as necessity dictated. And they would even exchange one white cat for another or one black cat for another from time to time. And finally, uh, when things became confused enough, they even started voting for spotted cats and calico cats. But nothing ever changed. The big got bigger, the rich got richer, the poor got poorer, and the weak got weaker. And the Canadians finally asked themselves a few years ago, what makes a difference whether we vote for a white cat, a black cat, or a spotted cat? All cats eat mice. And it was out of that recognition, finally, that uh, Canadian workers and some of the farmers and some of the Main Street business people of the country formed their own political party. And they call it the New Democratic Party. And today, they wield the balance of power in the Canadian national parliamentary system and are the party in power in several of the provinces. And they've put together a rather impressive string of successive victories, well-publicized victories, in provincial and local elections around Canada. And they've already put the blocks very solidly to exploitation and price gouging by the major oil companies, pig oil as we like to call them in our union, and the big bankers and all of the institutional investors of that country are today scared to death of the new Democratic Party. They have a national health care system, second to none either, in quality and quantity. No citizen today goes without health care in the Dominion of Canada. And even a U.S. citizen visiting that country, taken ill or having an accident of any kind, gets every bit of health care that it takes to restore them to a place in society. The doctors get upset, get angry every now and then, <clears throat> and strike for higher fees. See, they're even learning about it. To <laughs> conduct a little strike for higher fees. But at least the doctors up there admit that they have an overriding public duty to perform, and collective bargaining is just part of the process that adjudicates their role in the fulfillment of that duty, very much as you and me. Not very many doctors are tax loss farmers in Canada either. And meanwhile, south of the border, here in our own country, you, you, <clears throat> the two-headed calf 
continues to dominate in every facet our political economy. And right now, it's not even feeding the sparrows. It's just passing gas. <clears throat> so we've got an economic depression, folks, not a recession. And I don't give a damn how the economic experts define a depression. <coughs> Excuse me, when 17 million workers in this country are out of work, when 600,000 people a week, and that's the average of initial claims for unemployment compensation weekly since last August, and when 600,000 a week of such claims are filed for economic burial insurance, because that's what it adds up to, when 160,000 machinist union members are working part-time out here, or marking time for the most part, in the Army of the Unemployed, and when the, the most basic of all of our industries, the machine tool industry, is operating at 52% of capacity, when all of industry is producing at only about two-thirds of its capacity, when people are standing in cheese lines and church-sponsored soup lines, forced to snap and snarl and grovel at the bottom of the economic heap like a pack of wild dogs chasing after the last scrap of meat tossed out the penthouse window, when 1,000 people show up for an interview for five measly job opportunities out in the Los Angeles warehouse district, when the growth industries in the country are yard sales and street vending, that's the two fastest growing things we have today, when farmers are being foreclosed by the dozens from Pennsylvania to the Panhandle, from Minnesota to Alabama, and when the only job and educational opportunities our kids have are in the Army, the Air Force, the Navy, or the Marines, then I say to you, we're in an economic depression with a capital D. And the great communicator over there for the top of the pyramid crowd had better quit smiling one of these days. Stop laughing. Stop telling us his uh, good old boy jokes and change his course as well as his lines. And over in the Congress of the country, that two-headed calf that was suckered into Reaganomics, suckered into this supply side and monetarism program that we suffer, better stop beating at the corporate pack trough, quit trying to sell us the thistles of free market economics, and start taking stock in America, and deal with economic realities and not fantasies. Ronald Reagan now wants to put American farmers on the surplus grain dole. He'll give you back the grain you can't sell in the first place, if you'll idle half your land. That may get the price of grain up in the short run, but I'll lay dollars of donuts that all that free feed grain will drive down cattle and hog prices as the protein is converted. How many grain farm operators are set up to feed livestock? And how many livestock feeders are grain producers? Once that system gets in place, what's going to happen to the implement dealers, the elevators, machine shops, mechanics, and merchants in rural America that depend on real farm production for a slice of the pie? But underlying even those surface queries is one basic question which neither the great communicator nor the two-headed calf has dared to ask since the 1950s. And that question is, how in the hell can this nation square food surpluses in the face of poverty-induced hunger? How can we square that with malnutrition, starvation, here in America and all over the world? What's wrong with an economic delivery system that can't distribute food and basic farm commodities to people who are literally dying in need of them at home and abroad. 
This nation has always found a way to distribute guns, missiles, jet aircraft, and all the munitions that imply that they imply to every nook and cranny of the world. But we can't or won't let the American farmer produce full till and supply the world with food. The Farm Bureau, the Chamber of Commerce, the Business Roundtable, the Republican Party, and Farm Belt Democrats all praise the American farmers' productivity and their other virtues to the highest heavens. But they're just blowing smoke if they won't sit down and redesign the food delivery system that will permit farmers to operate at full capacity and feed this nation and feed the world. Worse still, Reaganomics is systematically dismantling the pitifully inadequate system that already exists. Food stamps and school lunches have been drastically cut back for the unemployed and their kids. Does that make anyone happy? Is that the way this once great nation of ours ought to be acting toward those who are down and out? Do those cutbacks help farmers sell more grain, more meat, more dairy products somewhere else? Are those cutbacks balancing the budget? Are they putting people back to work? You know the answers as well as I do. Ronald Reagan has a very hard time dealing with grain exports to the Soviet Union because he couldn't decide whether to kill them or feed them. <laughs> but when election time rolled around, all that breast beating we saw so much of and that shoot-from-the-lip talk for which he's so famous got very watered down. And the grain farmers of America led Ronald Reagan right to the water and made him float on his back because he lifted the grain embargo. So now he wants to both feed and shoot the Soviets. <laughs> Why doesn't he just call those grain shipments food for peace and sit down and start hammering out a productive farm policy and begin designing an attack on hunger that will distribute food fairly at home and abroad? Taking food from the mouths of American babes and bread off the tables of our unemployed and widowed and divorced mothers isn't going to solve the farmer's economic plight or the American worker's plight. The truth is and has been that social spending is not wrecking the economy of this country and social spending is not creating Ronald Reagan's $180 billion budget deficit, if we're lucky. Reaganomics is. It's <clears throat> and it is directly linked to his colossal military buildup. <clears throat> dollar for dollar, right down the line, every cut Ronald Reagan has made in the social budget he has picked up and transferred lock, stock, and barrel to the military budget, plus a bonus of uh, the first year some $45 billion, and the second year a couple of times that. And I would ask you, are the Russians coming? I've been hearing that all of my adult life. Every time the politicians want to focus attention away from their sins, they generate the specter of the Russians are coming, the Russians are coming. And every American, every American born with that full measure of devout patriotism that is uniquely ours, finds it rise up out of his stomach, swells out his chest, rigidly salutes old glory, responds to the call, and as often as not in my experience, while we stand rigidly saluting the flag, they systematically pick our pockets. <laughs> uh, 
I haven't seen any of them yet, and I've been a close student of the game for over 40 years. Hell, they can't even get out of Afghanistan. And they can't quite get the Polish workers under control. And they haven't been able to win back the good graces of China. And the Czechs and Hungarians are tied into Western banks and trade deals, lousy ones too. And in fact, when you look at it and stop to reason it through, the Soviet Union is the only communist nation in the world surrounded by hostile communist countries. <laughs> Beware of standing too rigidly. Caspar Weinberger keeps telling us about the massive Soviet military buildup that's put the U.S. in second place in terms of military might. Yet the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General John Vesey, was on the tube again last night when he was asked specifically by Senator Carl Levin of Michigan if he would swap the U.S. military capability for that of the Soviets, responded, not on your life. Pressured further by the good senator, Vesey said flat out, I would not trade. And when appearing before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Senator, Wein uh, senator Percy asked Weinberger if he would rather have the Soviet nuclear arsenal or that of the United States. And Weinberger said, and I would quote him, I would not for a moment exchange anything because we have an immense edge in technology. So what the hell is the frantic buildup for? And I serve on a committee that meets regularly, an AFL-CIO committee that meets regularly with the entire spectrum of the best military minds in the country up to and including the Joint Chiefs and their chairman. And I have repeatedly asked that very same question, and I have yet to have the first military man in our entire apparatus say to us that he feels as though he would have to go into battle as a second-class power, or that he would in any way, shape, manner, or form entertain the idea of swapping what he has to fight with versus what the, the enemies, uh, real or imaginary, have. So much for that. The Soviets and the United States each have enough nuclear warheads and delivery systems to blow up the other 50 times over and even bounce the rubble around a little bit. <laughs> and a lot of people still walk around saying that the defense buildup is good for the economy because military spending creates jobs. Well, of course military spending creates a few jobs. Some jobs in missiles, aircraft, ordnance, and so on. But I'm here to tell you that for every $1 billion this nation invests in military production, we could generate from 10 to 40,000 more jobs by investing it in the private sector production. And it depends entirely on which of the industrial sectors that you insert the billion as to how many additional jobs you get out of it. And always remember this, when General Dynamics or Lockheed or McDonnell Douglas are out here borrowing money for the military production, <clears throat> and the federal government's borrowing money too to pay those contractors, that drives up interest rates irrevocably under Reagan's free market mon monetary policy. And hence, the predictions, and I think accurate ones, that interest rates were down for the election and will shortly begin inching their way back up. If we exclude the federal government's commitment to our senior citizens and the Social Security system, which really is trust fund money paid for by employers and workers and farmers and citizens, paid for by earmarked payroll taxes, and can't legally be used for any other purpose, we exclude those trust funds and Social Security payments from the federal budget, then you quickly find that the military-related spending currently accounts for 54% of the federal budget outlays.
And under our President, with his $1.6 trillion buildup, the military share of that budget by the end of his term on the same basis is going to be 78 percent. Meanwhile, people are out of work, businesses are going bankrupt, and farmers live every day in the process of or under the fear of foreclosure. And I'm here to tell you that we can't provide a strong national defense for this country on the backs of the unemployed, the displaced, and the poor. A bankrupt America is a weak America, flat out. And uh, before closing out these rather random, I guess, remarks, I'd like to raise one more issue with you. Too many times the media and corporate America reports to the public that high union wages are making United States industry uncompetitive or non-competitive, whichever is the most acceptable. Well, let me ask you, and just think along with me for a moment. Which of your costs have increased the most over the past decade? Labor costs or energy and fertilizer costs? Evidence shows us that unit labor costs in the United States of America from the years 1973 to 1980 have been lower and increased less than those of any other major industrial democracy in the world. The numbers right out of our Department of Labor show us that unit labor costs in the U.S. for those years rose by 7.5%. In Japan, they went up 8.5%. In West Germany, 11.2%. In France, 11 In Britain, 155 In Italy, 96 And the only one in the world lower than us, Canada, at 6.4%. Now, you figure up quickly your energy cost increases, fertilizer cost increases over that same period of time. And if our figures are correct, they more than quadrupled. Now, the United States buys natural gas from down in Mexico, a major ingredient in the production of fertilizer. And we pay some $2.40 a thousand cubic feet for it. Mexico sells the same natural gas to its own citizens for 44 cents a thousand cubic feet. And what big oil has ripped off over the past 10 years in the United States of America adds up to just a, to over the GNP of a hell of a lot of countries in the world. Another recent study conducted by the Council on Economic Priorities in New York covering the year of 1980, it was found in the United States that workers are in 10th place in average wage and benefit levels and in 13th place in terms of wage gains adjusted for inflation. And that's on the world totem pole of so-called democratic industrialized democracies. Most every Western European nation, and even Japan, exceeded our wage and benefit levels when totaled together. And meanwhile, our multinational employers have been engaged in uh, the conduct of shipping capital out of the country in massive doses and crying capital crunch and hence higher profit margins and higher interest rates, need more savings, we have a capital crunch, and systematically shipping it out of the country to all of the world, but the major portion going to the already industrialized democracies of Europe and the Far East. We hear a lot of third world and fourth world cop-outs that we have to invest there. Well, certainly we do if we're going to sell there. But the lion's share of the investment isn't going there. That is tokenism compared to the, the total, because U.S. corporate investment overseas in this country has been averaging about $14 billion a year ever since the 1960s. 
And the excuse always is that we want to penetrate their markets. There are rich markets in those places where workers are highly paid, well-fed, have great cradle to the grave socialism, which we're told, of course, we can't have in this country. But every one of those billions of dollars invested over there costs Americans 26,500 jobs. And altogether, the U.S. corporations have a total of in excess of $40 billion invested in the industrialized nations of Europe. And I say to you, it's high time these cats began to invest in America and produce in America. <laughs> that way, maybe we can have a well-paid and well-fed population as well. To sum all this up, I'm saying, firstly, that the 